I was sitting there enjoying the truth of that. Did he do a wonderful thing for you when he took your sins away? Amen. You know, if Jesus never did anything else for us in all our lives, if he never gave us another single blessing, we had to live in poverty and want in this world the rest of our lives, just what he's already done would be enough, wouldn't it? You get right down her to the nitty gritty of things. The home in heaven is worth everything, and to book. And He's given us all kinds. That's why the Scripture says, "Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits," because His benefit program outdoes anything you've ever heard tell of. I'll tell you another thing too: the government won't run in and seize the assets either. I mean, you know, a lot of these benefit programs, a lot of pension programs, they're going to be bankrupt when it comes time to get them. And, uh, but God's benefit program is never affected by what's going on down here. It's settled, stated from his word. I see one of our young couples back in have been on the alien list, I understand. You kids better, Mickey, Marla? You feeling better? Good. I'm sitting over there behind the piano, and that's about the only thing around here that's bigger than I am, but I can't see past it very handy. Let's go to the book of Mark, where we left off this morning. Last night, I believe, the best I recall. How to spend your money, well, how not to spend your money, I believe, is more of the emphasis. We, uh, he was talking about the seed that was sown in the ground, the four different kinds of ground. The good ground yielded different yields, although it was all good ground, some of it yielded more than others. Guess what? Christians are not all the same. But I'll tell you what, Jesus taught that in several places. You remember in the lesson of the talents? They didn't all have the same amount given to them. They didn't all produce the same amount. But if you produce the best, if you're a 30-fold person and you produce, you say, well, I'm not, I'm not very gifted, so I'll just produce 15-fold. But then you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're not, you're docked 50 percent. If you're one of those 60-fold person, you say, well, you know, it's just too easy for me. I'll just slide along. I'll produce 30-fold and get 100 percent. No, you get 50 percent because you're capable of doing more. If you're one of those hundredfold, you decide you'll coast along. Well, I, I can outdo those thirtyfold people and everything. I'll just, I'll just shoot for fifty, or sixty, and I'll still be in the ballpark. No, you'll be graded down because you were capable of more. To whom much is given, much is required. A lot of people have forgotten that that's God's way of measuring things. He doesn't measure us against each other. He measures us against ourselves. Aren't you glad? I mean, if you had to measure up and see who's going to be the heaviest, me or you, you'd come out in bad shape, wouldn't you, Jim? <laughs> He's looking there thinking, thank the Lord. <laughs> I shouldn't have said bad shape. You'd have come out light. All right, that's better. But uh, God grades us against ourselves. And he knows what the input is. He knows what we should put out, and he sees what we do put out. And so the thing is, you don't have to outdo somebody else, some other Christian. You see other Christians maybe who are very gifted in certain areas, and they're very capable and talented, and they're able to do this and that and the other, many things you can't do. And you say, well, there's no use of me even trying because I'll never even get in the, in the game because I just don't have what they have. No, if you produce the maximum of what you've got, then you make a 100% score. That person you're admiring may be one of those 60-fold people, and they're just scooting along, just barely getting 40%. Well, see, they're down. They're, they're below level. They're below grade level. And if you're producing 30-fold, and that's the best you can do, then you get 100%. Don't you like God's grading method? I mean, you, you don't, uh, and, and you, you talented, brilliant, gifted people, you're not going to get away with anything, you see. You're not going to be able to loaf. I got that, uh, when I went away to college, they gave us some placement tests. And I went into this university, and uh, I'd always been pretty good on English and reading, never had much problem with it. 
And uh, so they screened us with the English test, placement test, and guess what? I got in a class of 30 kids and they were all A and A plus students. I want you to know I had to work. It was disgusting. In a regular classroom, I could kind of loaf along because the other kids, there's always some dragging way behind. And you know, you didn't have to really, but you get in there with, with all of them the same ability level, you got to get in there and work. You, you're pulling against somebody that can pull as hard as you can. And it's the same way with God's people. God has placement tests, and he knows where you're placed. So don't you get all upset if you don't seem to be producing what somebody else is. If you're doing the best you can, then God's satisfied. But now on the other hand, don't you sit out on your hands and say, well, I ain't doing anything. I remember a fellow in the Bible that did that, had one talent, said, well, I don't have as much as the others. I don't have as much ability, I'll just run off and bury mine. Well, you do that, and then when, when the time for tallying up, he'll take it away from you and give it to somebody else that produced. We are to produce what we're capable of producing. And it's, you know, it's infinitely fair. When you think this through, it's just so fair. Because God doesn't expect you to do what other people does. He expects you to do what he's equipped you to do. And then when you begin to understand this about other believers, and all you'll do is encourage them to do their best, and you won't be pushing them to, to go above what they really are capable of doing. And it's a little hard for us to tell because we don't really know how much input's been in there. You say, well, they heard as many sermons as I did. Well, they may have had their ears closed half the time. Of course, they're chargeable for that. Some people do very well with very little. When I was teaching school, they used to give me the kids that were having learning problems. Because I didn't mind working with them. The other teachers said, oh, don't put them in here. And I'd take them in a classroom, and I taught all the subjects except art and gym, I think it was. We sent them out for that. I taught them everything else. Oh, I had those little beasties under my thumb all the time. There was no escape possible. Because I knew exactly what they couldn't tell them. Say, well, my other, my other class, they assigned a big homework assignment. See, I knew what I gave them. It worked out real fine because I found out that I had students who were capable of a great deal weren't producing much. And I had some other students who weren't near as good, but they worked so hard until they overachieved, they went beyond those who had more ability. And I watched that in, that works in the schoolroom, that'll work in the world. Uh, you've seen it out in the factories, and places where you work, and it'll work in the, in the spirit realm also. There are some people who are not very talented but they are really in love with the Lord, and they go full throttle. And they produce more fruit than some of those who could do it much more easily, but who choose to loaf and get their priorities messed up, and they don't do what they're capable of doing. I hope you'll constantly evaluate and reevaluate your priorities of what's the most important thing. You've only got 24 hours in the day. There's no way you can slice it. And you're going to have to use them some way, so you have to, and you have to decide, really, how you're going to use those things. You say, well, I don't have any time. Yes, you do. One of the most embarrassing things you'll ever do is keep a time chart on yourself for one day. Just use a stopwatch on yourself and mark down every time you do this, that, and the other, and you'll be surprised you're wasting half the time you've got. I mean, just absolutely wasting, just sitting looking out the window. Now it went five minutes, five minutes, oh my, where'd that go? Well, you didn't accomplish anything. You looked out the window and I didn't see even, even birds didn't fly when you looked. So you didn't really accomplish anything. God wants us to do our best and he's satisfied when we do our best. Isn't that great? Now let's go to Mark chapter 4, verse 21. He said, as a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, not to be set on a candlestick. Now, understand the word candle here is used in 1611. It really, we're talking about a lampstand in most cases where candle is used. Because they use lamps. But regardless, it doesn't really matter. Do you bring a lamp or a candle in and then put a bushel basket over it? 
when you say, well, no, the idea of bringing it in and putting it on a stand is so that it'll give off light and light the room. If you put a basket over it, it covers its light. And he said, there's nothing hid that will not be manifested, neither is there anything kept secret that but should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That's some pretty serious things, isn't it? And he said, take heed what you hear and what measure you meet, what measure you meet. It may measure to you. Be careful how you deal out because that's the way you're going to be dealt with. Ooh. The old saying is, you know, keep your words sweet. You never know when you'll have to eat them. Did you ever have a meal of a, a crow? That's what they call it, you know, when you get caught with your foot in your mouth and uh, you have to eat crow, they call it. Did you ever eat some crow? Not the big black bird, but the big idiotic mess that you made. Did you have to stand there and eat it? Oh, it didn't taste good, did it? Or some of us who are greatly wise, we don't ever have to do that. But the average person does have to do this a great deal. And he says, take care of the kind of measurements that you use. The same measure you use with other people, it'll come back to you. As somebody said, what, what goes around comes around. And, uh, I mean, you send it out and it'll come back. So be sure when you send it out, keep your words sweet because you never know when you're going to have to eat them. If you're going to have to eat them, you might as well, they might as well taste sweet. It's awful to have to eat bitter words, isn't it? And he said, it'll be measured to you and unto you that here shall more be given. He said, now those of you who are smart enough to listen to what I'm telling you and take heed to it, he said, more will be given to you. One of the reasons that our growth in grace and knowledge of the Lord slows down or seems to cease at times is because we are not profitably using that which God has given us. And God is waiting for us to take advantage and to put into practice what he's already taught us. For he that has, to him shall be given. He that has not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. What's he saying? To him that has, more will be given. To him that has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, it's that same principle. If you don't use what you've got, it's going to spoil on you. you got worms in the manna. You've heard that story, haven't you? Every day, you know, they got manna from heaven for six days. On the, six, on the sixth day, enough fell for two days. They, pay, they were so much, uh, what is it, omer through, uh, I don't remember, about a pint and a half or something, three pints or something like per person was to be gathered up. They went out every morning. There it was, special delivery. Uh, somebody figured up how many tons of bread that was. For two to three million people, can you imagine how, how much it would be for everybody to have a bite, let alone a nice meal, three meals out of it? And God sent it, and it was spread out in little bitty pieces, so they went around and picked it up. He said, well, why did he do that? Because they needed something to do. After all, he fixed the food for them. And did you know that God still gives people something to do a lot of times that he could do for them better? But he wants you and me to get in action and do something lest we become so lazy we're not worth shooting. There are some people just so lazy, you know, I don't know, it would be worth the powder to blow them off the earth. I mean, if a, if a bug was biting them, they'd say, would you mind swatting that bug, please? I'm afraid it'll exhaust me to lift my hand and swat it, you know. And God doesn't want us to become lazy. He wants us to be energetic and use what we have. And he's urging us to do it. In the case of manna, some of them got real smart and said, I'm going to gather up enough for a whole week. <laughs> There's plenty out here. There's not any lack. The only thing that stopped that is because God said don't do it. But, of course, you know, he's not looking. And uh, so they gathered up a nice big bunch and said, well, we'll just gather every other day or and I tell you, the next morning, you didn't have to wonder where it was. Because overnight, every bit of it that was over the amount God told them to get, 
bred worms and stank. Now that just means it was full of maggots. Have you ever seen the maggots work? Yeah, Do you ever smell where they work in? Some of you are looking sick. Yeah, that's the way they felt too. Imagine waking up in the tent, you know. <coughs> Ooh. Ooh, what on earth? Something died. Ooh, what is the matter? The commode must be running over. And they got to looking around, you know, and you didn't have to wonder where it, where it was, where the disobedient people were. You could just go right there. And, those, and besides that, they were coming out of the tent, waving the flaps, trying to get the scent out. It was terrible. Because when they disobeyed God, all their efforts were rotten. When they obeyed God, they had enough to keep them and sustain them. It's a lesson there for us. Get in harmony with what God says to do. And do it. And you'll have all that you need. Well, he, um, he says, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man cast seed in the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up. Verse 27, He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of the herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. Now here's another, here's another principle that's all the way through God's Word. This is a very important one. First the blade, then the ear, then after that the full corn in the ear. Now see, when you start out as a Christian, you see somebody over here who's a roasting ear, you know, and you think, boy, that's what I want right there. And they say, no, you have to be a little blade first. Well, that's not impressive. And then the, then the ear, you have to be the blossom and all that. It takes a while to grow ear corn, doesn't it? But the Bible principle is that it grows slowly and steadily to produce. One of the nice things, another thing about this, um, or is he talking about corn? He's probably talking about rye or barley because they didn't have corn like we have it. But I just translated it in our jargon. But you can do the same thing with wheat or barley or rye. Any of those grains that they're referring to, they all grow up. And when you plant one seed, you get another seed on top of that stalk, don't you? So you get one for one. You plant one, you get one. That's the way it works. If it did, we'd soon be out of things, wouldn't we? No, for every seed, you get several hits full of grains. So there's a multiplying. And so there's going to be a multiplying of what's planted will come up and multiply and feed more, far more than it did first. Just the one, one grain. Now when the fruit's brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it? He said, what can we compare the kingdom of God? He said, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the earth is less than all the seeds in the earth. Little tiny mustard seed. He said, but when it's sown, it grows up, it becomes greater than all the herbs, shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. He talks about the mustard seed sprouting up. It starts off with a tiny little beginning, and then it sprouts up and makes a great big bush, big enough for birds to roost in. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. Without a parable spake not he unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciple. A parable, again, is comes the Greek word parabole, which means to throw alongside of. And he threw alongside of a spiritual truth, an earthly story that illustrated that spiritual truth so they could grasp it. We have to have this to help us to grasp what we need. Now, um, the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, let's pass over to the other side. When they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Full of what? Full of water. 
and he was in the hinder of the back part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Now remember, these are fishermen here, but this storm was something else. It was just literally tearing that boat apart, and they were shipping water, and the boat was shipping water, getting too full of water, wallowing in the, in the seas. And they came up and they waked him up and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and said, Now, Lord, we ask you to calm the wind. No, he just said, I re he rebuked the wind and said, Stop it. And said to the sea, Peace, be still. Just like you'd say to a puppy dog that's bouncing around out of order. He just rebuked the wind and said, you be still. Turned to the water, peace, be still. And I want you to know the wind ceased, the sea went shoo. That was the end of that storm. Now these boys had seen a lot of storms come and go, but they've never seen one go this fast. Now, this storm, I believe, was stirred up by the devil. Jesus was exhausted. He was asleep in the back of the ship. You know, you have to feel sorry for Satan in a sense sometimes because he actually thought he could sink the ship Jesus was riding in. He had it full of water. He scared the daylights out of the disciples. They were, they were shook up. They thought they were going down there. They said, Lord, don't you care that we're going to die? At least wake up for the death, you know. I mean, you know, we're fixing to all be drowned, but wake up so we can talk about it before we go. I mean, they were upset. The only one that wasn't upset was Jesus. He got up and said, be still. Peace, be still. And when the water stopped, he said to the wind, I rebuke you, prince of the power of the air. And it did. And they said, uh, he said, why are you so fearful? Why are you so shook up? What are you all like this? And how is it that you have no faith? Can you see those hangdog expressions, all of that boat? I mean, how embarrassing. A few minutes before, they all said, wake him up! To sleep, for goodness sake, get him up! We're going to sink. They were all hysterical. Now he's saying, why are you so fearful? What in the world's the matter with you boys? Haven't you learned anything yet? And how is it that you don't have any faith? You think this boat was going to sink? They didn't want to talk about it. You get that way with the Lord sometimes when he starts popping you with questions. Why are you so fearful? Why is it you don't have any faith? We get in these situations, you know. We don't like it. It's not the way we planned it. And we just get very angry. You know, one of the reasons we get angry is because we're righteous. And it's not fair for the righteous to have to undergo things like this. That ought to be reserved for ugly, lost people, mean folks, backsliders. They deserve it. But not me. I'm walking in holiness and righteousness. How come I had to hit my finger? Now i got a big sore finger. Hmm? But you have to realize that the righteous are the targets of the enemy. And the next time you're about to go to pieces about something, just have pull your string and say, ho, 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 wait a minute. You're doing it to me again, aren't you? You're trying to get me to blow up. You just want the Lord to come in and say, how, how is it you're so fearful and why is it you have no faith? I've been through that. Thank you. No. Lord, let's get something done about this thing, but I'm not going to go to pieces this time. I refuse. I'm not going to let the devil manipulate me anymore. Now, you're going to have to think about this ahead of time because these things hit so suddenly until before you know it, you'll be in the midst of a... Rum, 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 rum. And then if somebody tries to remind you, you get mad at them. Nag, nag, nag. Because I don't want to hear it. But if we'll start checking it out, I think you'll find the devil is arranging all kinds of little irritations for us every day. 
one of the things he does for me, things are always missing. And when I get sanctified, I won't look like this anymore about it. When I'm looking for something I just had, I've been in my chair for an hour working, I have not moved out of my tracks, everything is as it always was, and that's that one necessary paper, I'm ready to put it in the envelope, and it's gone. I don't have a copy of it, I have to have that paper. It's hard, you know, and these are the things that really come in to irritate and upset us and goad us into anger, don't they? A lot of times, if you'll start watching these things, you'll, you'll, find, you'll, you'll see how funny it is. And you'll start laughing at it. I remember last night I was coming home and I was supposed to pick up something in the grocery store. And I left the church thinking I've got to stop at this particular store down there on Indianapolis. And, and I just sailed right through Indianapolis just to sing in and having a good time and went right on down and got halfway home. <gasps> i got to go back to that store. Well, I thought, well, it's my own stupid fault. I was thinking about it all the way up to Indianapolis, and then I just went right on through the light, just like I didn't had good sense. So it went on home, started on home. My van's trained. All I had to do is just crank it and point it, and it goes. You know, it, it knows the way home. It's hard to get it out of the track. But anyway, I turned around, and I came back. I said, okay, you're not going to get me upset about that. I'm going to go back and get the article. I went back. The store's closed. I thought, boy, you're really laying it on me tonight, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. The item's not on sale at the other store, but I'm going to buy it anyhow, and I'm going to be happy, 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 you understand? <laughs> I'll be happy if I have to pay twice as much, you understand that? So I happily drove into the other store. <laughs> Guess what? No, it was open. <laughs> I walked in. Guess what? The, the thing I needed was on sale cheaper than at the other store. I was happy, happy, happy. <laughs> but these are the little things, you know, that the devil puts us through the ringer. And if we start watching for him to see what he's doing to us, we'll say, you're not taking me down that road anymore. No! You're the only one who'll get any enjoyment out of that. I'm not going to get my stomach upset. I'm not going to get my adrenaline flowing just because of some stupid thing that I did or somebody else did. It's a lot easier to get upset about what other people did, isn't it? Somebody turns right in front of you without signaling. I used to have a friend, a preacher friend. He was funny. We'd be driving along the expressway. He'd be driving. And if somebody passed him and they turned and kind of grinned as they went by, he would go 80 miles an hour to overtake them and pass them and say, like that. And I'd say, slow down. Don't go so fast. He's not going to do that to me. And he just couldn't stand it. He just, you say, who is it? None of your business. It wasn't me, though. I'm not guilty on that one. You say, well, tell us about you. No. I don't tell you nothing. Just examine yourself. See if you be in the faith. <laughs> we all need to realize, though, that the devil is shaking us with these little everyday things. We think that it's going to be some great calamity. Well, it might be. But he prepares us and he softens us up with all these little things to get us all upset and fragile before the big things hit. <clears throat> and Jesus is still saying, how is it that you're so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you knew to send angels and bind and loose, but you didn't bother? Hmm? I know, uh, I want to tell you a little cute little thing that happened this morning. <laughs> I got this little bookmark somebody left up here and gave it to me, I don't remember. I might probably stole it from somebody, I don't remember. But uh, it's mine now. 
And anyway, I'd been looking over the scripture passage. I put it into my Bible like that so I could open it up without any trouble to find where it was. Guess what? When I picked up my Bible, the stupid string caught on my coat button and pulled out. Now I have to go back and hunt my passage again. I thought, you did that. You did it on purpose. But that's all right. I know what passage I was in. I'm going back and get into it. There are all kinds of little irritations that are surrounding us every day. If you get to recognizing how the devil is working on you, you think, boy, you must be leaving everybody else alone today. No, he's not. He's got a special contingent assigned to you just to aggravate you and to irritate, and they find the little fringes where it's the most irritating, and that's the ones they work with you. It's easy to tell somebody else to be calm. It's not very easy to be calm yourself, is it? Well, he said, how is it you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, what manner of man is this that even the winds of sea obey? He said, good land. Did you see that? The wind backed off when he said, stop it, and the waves put thrashing around. And they came over to the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. And when he came out of the ship, an interesting thing happened. Immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Immediately, somebody living in the graveyard came running out to confront him. Lived among the dead folks. This poor man was demonized to the extreme degree. And uh, he had an unclean spirit. Well, it was a pretty good size one if it was just one because they, uh, he lived in the tombs out in the graveyard because no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Have you ever seen anybody that chains couldn't hold? I mean, that thing, uh, now you've been around long enough, most of you here at Hagridge have seen demons do strange things that can't be done. And you know this, the unbelievable strength they have sometimes. This one could snap chains. So when they got out of hand and they tried to chain him up to, till he calmed down, he'd pop the chains off. I remember in the old church we had some oak pews, solid oak pews we'd bought from the Methodist church. We deep water baptized them before we let them in the building. But um, they were good pews. They had a lot of good sitting in them. And uh, so I remember they were heavy. They were solid oak. Oak is heavy, and they were, about, I don't know, 14 foot long. And uh, I remember one time we were in the midst of a service. Mm -hmm. I guess it was calling it probably a mass deliverance, calling out demons or something. And had the invitation going, and or maybe just the invitation. And there was a 15-year-old boy standing there. And he was standing right on the aisle, about third pew back, and he was looking at me going, I mean, he, he didn't take his eyes off me. I kind of kept my eyes on him, too, because I didn't know what he might take in after me just the most any time. Now, uh, for the benefit of you visitors, you newer folks, things are nicer now than they used to be. We used to be in a small place, and there was no place to run to get away. I mean, when one charge, it almost certainly gets you because there wasn't any place for you to back up to. I remember one time I was, I was over here dramatically alongside the pulpit and I was doing like this and I was calling out names. A boy sitting on the front pew, sitting by my wife, and she looked at him, she saw him doing like this, and she said, give me your glasses. So he didn't say anything, he just handed her glasses. And boy, in a minute, he came up in there with a roar and he came just like a train, just in locomotive in full speed. And he hit me just like a, we were playing football. And he was going to take me out. And I was standing here. He knocked me all the way back to the wall, about 10 foot back there. And down we went in the heap. He said, you're not going to call my name. And boy, he came after me. Boom. And back against the wall we went. And we ended up rolling around under the piano. And I was laughing. He was trying to choke me. He was growling and saying he going to kill me, and I was laughing. Well, he was kind of hilarious, you know. I thought it was kind of fun to get reactions, you know. I was young and foolish then. Wasn't as dignified as I am now. 
And the boys, about five or six boys, pulled him off of me, and they were rolling around on the piano. And I remember one of my daughters, was, we had a nursery glassed in, kind of like the control room back there. One of my daughters would happen to be back there helping, and she heard the commotion and saw me go down. She got worried. She came up. She said, then I saw Dad get up and start reading his list again, laughing, so I knew he was all right. And they continued to, this thing was under the piano screaming while they were extracting the demons. He's rolling around on this. This old piano's had a lot of experience, too. Now, if this piano could talk, it could tell you lots of things. It's, it's been around. It's a wonder it hadn't got hit. <laughs> Fortunately, you can roll under it. That helps. I've, I've been around under there several times. I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to try it now. I might get stuck when I turned over. But. <laughs> We did have some good times over there, <laughs> but I was, I've, I've had demons do a lot of strange things. How did I get way off over there? I don't even remember. I was having such a good time remembering that. It's nice for the demons to hate you, you know, and really know where you live. I mean, you get tired of it sometimes, but after all, they wouldn't be, aggrav they wouldn't be after you so hard if you weren't doing something right. That's out of a comfort, I think, to, to know that you're aggravating the daylights out of the enemy so that he can't stand it, he can't leave you alone, just has to keep picking at you all the time. Well, this, uh, oh, we're talking about the strength of demons. I started telling you about this little 15-year-old boy. He's standing out there. And uh, so he was upset, and that's one reason I was watching him, because I had been charged from the audience before, you know. And I knew that it was quite possible that he could suddenly take off like a rocket ship and be there before I had time to sneeze even, let alone dodge him. But um, anyway, in a, in a little bit, he just stood there, and I just looked at him, and I said, hey, 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 hey. And that seemed to just infuriate him, and he just clamped down on that bench, and he raised it up, and he almost dumped a bunch of people off of us. He lifted that pew up high enough that the people on it went, Ugh! you know, they almost dumped off. And uh, it was funny because, well, of course, eventually he did end up on the floor. I guess he got tired of standing up. But anyway, uh, and some of the other boys got tired and they laid down there with him for a while. And, and uh, he lost a lot of demons and he came back. It was funny because afterwards he, he looked like he'd been digging ditches for a while. He was all sweaty, his shirt tail was out and uh, all this sort of thing. And he walked back there, he was grinning, and he walked back to that pew and tried to pick it up, empty. And he could just barely move it. It was that heavy. It was hard for him. And to think all those people were sitting on that thing. And he almost dumped them off the floor. Or the demon did. Now these demons have supernatural strength. There's no doubt about it. If you don't believe you happen to be visiting tonight, you stick around there. The Lord might show you one. Or you might have one. You can never tell. And if you have one, chances are they'll get stirred up around here because they do. It's nice that they have a place that they hate to come to. Most places they like to go because they irritate everybody and upset everything. Here they get upset themselves and they hate to come here because it's hard on them. All right. Um, so they bound him with chains that wouldn't do any good. And they said he'd, you know, they'd often bound him, verse 4, with fetters and chains. The chains had been plucked asunder by him. He just plucked them apart. And uh, the fetters were broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. He was just wild. There was no way. When that demon came out manifesting, he would just tear up the country and there was nothing that could stop him. Always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Now he had to be driven out of the community. He got, see, when you get highly demonized, you first you lose your family. Because they get to where they can't stand you. They get to a limit. They can't take it anymore. And you have to leave. You lose your family. He lost contact with everybody else because eventually he couldn't even be around the heathen. And he had to live out in the graveyard because where a bunch of dead folks were buried. That's the only place he could live. And even there he was tormented. And all night long he'd go up, up and down and he'd cut himself on the stones. 
This demon was constantly tossing him around and throwing him to bruise him, to cut him up. He was a mass of cuts and bruises all the time. And he'd be weeping and crying because he was so tormented. And you'd hear him crying in the night because he was so tormented and afflicted. Can you imagine how the loved ones of this man felt? Yet they couldn't stand him in the house. He'd tear the house apart. He'd hurt somebody. He had to be driven completely out. Now when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now who do you suppose ran and worshipped Jesus? I have a hard time thinking the demon did. Uh, on the experience I've had with demons, they try to run the other way. They're anxious to get away from Jesus. They're not anxious to get close to where he is or where he's operating. So I think this man, the one deep down inside that was weeping and crying, had gotten all messed up with demons somehow or another, either by inheritance, by uh, fooling with them, or however. At any rate, he was a mess. He was out of control. There was nothing he could do about it. But deep inside, there was a man who wanted longingly to be free of this awful living death, of living in a body that was constantly tormented and torn by this wicked spirit. Now when the man saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Another account says he ran and fell on his face. He fell down before him. Now this man doesn't ever say anything. The demon takes over. I think the man, I'm convinced that the man mustered up every ounce of strength that he had and ran as hard as he could to get to Jesus and he fell at his feet and that's as far as he could go. He couldn't ask for help. The only thing he could do was run to Jesus because he, the demons took over. They controlled things so high. And they had fought him even trying to run to Jesus, but he broke loose and he overrode them and he got to Jesus and fell at his feet. And the demon then cries with a loud voice and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that you torment me not. Now you see what happened when the demon confronted Jesus, he began to address him as the son of the most high God. Now remember Jesus when he had been in the synagogue in the presence of his enemies, religious enemies, he had forbade the demon to say anything. He told him, shut up, don't talk about it. Here he doesn't do that at all. Because there's nobody present but his disciples. And there's nobody to be tipped off that he's the son of God prematurely. So there was nothing wrong with the demon talking. And he was reacting like any demon should. When he met up with Jesus or the power of Jesus, he reacts violently. Now he says this, for Jesus said to him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now I don't remember what's this instance or another one. Where the Greek verb said means that he kept on saying to him a repeated action they have a verb in the Greek that means something has happened is happening and continues to happen and that's the, tenth, that's the tense of the verb that's used here at least in one of the accounts which tells us that Jesus had told him several times to come out now I'm quite sure he didn't have to tell him as often as we do but never, that nevertheless he did tell him more than once to come out he kept saying to him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then Jesus noticed the spirit didn't obey him. A lot of people say, Well, Jesus just spoke the word and it came right out. No, they didn't. Notice what happens here. He said, What's your name? And the spirit said, My name is the Legion, for we are many. And then the demon besought him. He began to beg and bargain with Jesus that he wouldn't send him out of the country. He said, please don't send us out of the country. Now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. Remember, you're in a Jewish community that's not supposed to be raised in hogs. These folks had slipped a little bit because it was so profitable to sell those hogs to the Gentiles who loved to have ham and eggs. And so therefore, uh, they, they bent their consciences a little bit to make it all right for them to sell them so long as they didn't eat it. And these Jewish folks had kind of forgotten their raisin. 
and they were raising hogs. I always wondered why Jesus destroyed somebody else's property until I ran across that fact that these people were Jews and they weren't supposed to be having hogs in the first place and Jesus helped them to correct their deviation. Now, uh, all the demons then began to beg him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. Now, I, um, when we first started out in this thing, a lot of times demons asked me where to go, and I would tell them to pick out an old pine rooter, that's a wild hog, down in the uh, hill country, of, uh, down in Arkansas or someplace, way down in the hills. And I wanted to go in that hog, and I wanted to pick one that was miles from any human being. And I've had them complain, that's no fun. I said, well, that's all right. Then I got to thinking about it. I might drive through Arkansas sometime. <laughs> and I'd hate to have a flat tire or something and get out and see a hog looking at me kind of, uh, huh, so you finally came, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I decided that might be a little dangerous to put them in those hogs. And uh, so one time, uh, when we were at the old church, I remember one asked me, uh, he was given, a, the person that was in was real tired and exhausted and been delivered for a long time, and this one was putting up quite a fight. And I said, you're going to have to leave, aren't you? And he said, yeah, but I'm going to fight a while longer yet. I'm going to tear him up before I go. I said, well, uh, you're pretty strong, but I'm going to get you anyway. He said, yeah, but I'm going to fight hard before I leave. I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you would leave easy and take all your demons with you, I could arrange for you to have a, another body to go into. He looked at me and he said, what are you talking about, Burley? I said, I'm talking about another body, aren't you interested? Yes. Whose body, yours? I said, uh-uh. He said, one of these fools walk around this church? I said, no. Well, who then? And I said, well, I'm going to tell you who. You have to agree to go first. No, I'm not going to agree to go. I said, well, if you don't, I'm going to send you to Tartars when they send you out. And I'm going to get you out. Well, tell me who, who it is, where, where it is. I said, no, I won't tell you until you agree. You positively agree you're going. He said, well... Not much of a choice, but anything's better than Tartarus. I said, yep, it is. You read the deal? He said, yeah. And I made him promise that he'd leave and go to that body I gave him. He said, all right, where is it, Willie? I said, you can pick the biggest fish in Lake Michigan and go. He said, oh, he said, fish are no fun. Now, I'll tell you what, if there'd been sharks in Lake Michigan, I would never send him out there. Because I figured that'd be the meanest shark in the whole lake. But he did, he did say, well, come on, guys, let's get out of here. And so they, they left. Then I got to thinking about that fish and no telling what might do to somebody that ate that thing. And uh, I got a little worried about that, so I came up with another wrinkle. I was dealing with another demon one time, and I said, I'll give you a body to go into if you leave. He said, no, I've heard about you. I don't go to no fish. <laughs> I said, no, it's not a fish. It ain't no fish. I promise it's not a fish. Are you lying to me? No. No, I'll send you into a real body. There's a person, I can't tell you that. Anyway, we badgered around a while, so he finally agreed to go, and I told him he could pick any penguin in the South Pole. I figured he could do as little problem as any down there pecking the other penguins. About all he could get into, and he left. Well, these demons didn't want Jesus to send them out of the country. They said, send us into the hogs. It's kind of bad, isn't it? They like hogs, too. And uh, that we may enter into them. So Jesus said, all right, go ahead. And the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down to a steep place in the sea, about 2,000 of them, and were choked in the sea. They ran off into the lake, choked. Well, now, I've often wondered, you know, when those, when those demons hit the hogs, they were so embarrassed, they ran off and committed suicide. 
Even a hawk didn't want to have demons in them. And uh, these demons that had tormented this man drove these poor swine into suicide. And they died. Now he had a lot of hogs hit the water. 2,000 of them. That's a pretty good sized herd, isn't it? Now they had some little boys keeping the hogs, watching after the hogs, like to scare them to death. Here goes their thundering herd right off the bluff, right into the water. Every one of them's gone. So they run in and tell them in the city and the country. Can you imagine those little boys? <laughs> oh, settle down, son. What's the matter? <laughs> they like scared those kids to death. They never seen anything like that. They knew about this demonized man. He was a town freak, you know. And they knew about him. And they saw this man tangled with him, and he didn't even fight. And then they saw these hogs run over like to scared them to death. And they finally get them settled down and find out what they're talking about. And uh, so the Gadara Hog Growers Association has an emergency meeting. And the committee goes out to check out this rumor, this dreadful rumor that something awful has happened to the herd of swine out there, outside the city. And they came to Jesus, and they saw him that was filled with demons and had the legion. Now notice what he's doing. He's sitting. Before he was roving night and day, night and day. He didn't know about the Doris Hope Grower Association? Is that what hit him? <laughs> Some people don't realize they had a hog growers association back there. That's the people that came out to see about it. You pinch people in their pocketbook and they'll show up. They'll come look you up. And uh, now he's sitting now. He's not running around aimlessly and screaming and cutting himself on rocks anymore. He's clothed. They couldn't keep clothes on him before. He'd rip all his clothes off. The interesting thing, when these people got full of the devil, they ripped their clothes off. As soon as they got delivered, they put them back on. Enough said. When people are full of the devil, they still rip all the clothes off. Watch them. Well, no, you better turn your head. It might be embarrassing. <laughs> and when they got, start getting delivered, they start wearing more modest apparel. He's sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. This man hadn't had a, a straight thought in years, possibly. He, his mind was so befogged and befuddled with demons. Now he's in his right mind. And what, happened, what was their reaction when they saw him? They were scared to death. They were afraid. Now, they didn't say, well, it's probably fake. <laughs> probably had it set up so that he could pretend to work a miracle. They knew this fellow. He was sitting clothed in his right mind, and it scared these men. And they that saw it told them how it befell him that was possessed with the demons, also concerning swine. They told the story about what happened. And in verse 17, they began to say, let's have a big meeting so everybody can get all their demons out. Wouldn't that be great? No, they didn't. They began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Now, if you don't think that's still in fashion, you go and have a spectacular deliverance. We get letters and calls all the time from people who come to a workshop or come here to the church, and they go back home, you know, they're all charged up, praise God, they're armed to the teeth, and they get their friends, set them down, sit down here. And boy, they go to work, and the demons come out screaming, the lives are changed, and then they think, boy, won't this be great? The whole church will be excited, and they are. Oh, are they excited. Like that one in Anchorage this morning, the whole church got upset hearing the screams coming out of the room next door. They get so excited, they'll ask you, please depart from us. We don't want that kind around here. You say, but it's biblical. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. That's why these folks driven over here from Detroit, isn't it? Because they don't want to hear it over in Detroit. Most places in Detroit, they're as close. Well, don't feel individual. There's 12 million people in here, and there's not too many places this is a welcome message here either. <laughs> 
this one little spot's open. God's got this one. He bought it and paid for it, so we just keep the horn honking. Just irritate. And we're blowing the trumpet in Zion to wake up the sleepy church. They say, leave us alone. Did you ever hate an alarm clock? There's no more raucous, ungodly sound than an alarm clock especially if it goes out off before daybreak. Ooh. I could almost sling it through the window before I think. It's whether it buzzes or where it goes beep, 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 beep. Shut up. You think I'm going back to sleep. Cheep, cheep, cheep. It's not like a whole bunch of birds over in a cage chirping around. We got one like that. So I'm going beep, you know. Some of them ring in your ear, your eardrum, your ears just flapping the breeze, or the vibration it seems like. And we're just like an alarm clock. We're supposed to ring the alarm that it's late, 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 and that there's a bomb in Gilead. And that Zion must awake quickly and take to, take to war to save the day. And that's not popular. They began to pray to ask him to go out of their death. Now, when they got in the ship, here's Jesus, his 12 disciples, his 13 men go in the ship. All of a sudden, there's 14 in there. And Jesus, I guess, I don't know, he's taking a head count. 13, 14. Here's the, here's the man that got delivered. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going with you. I don't want to stay with these folks. No, they didn't do me any good when I was when I was hurting, and I I'll just I'll just stick with you, please, sir. I'll just stay right with you. And so he he wants to go with Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't allow him to go. Isn't that something? That seems so cruel. Here, this man just getting started out, and Jesus said, "No, you can't go. Go home to thy friends." And tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and how he's had compassion on thee. Now you want a hard job? Go home and tell. You can pick up any stranger that walks in here looking for help. And you can sit down and talk to them. And They've come. They're eager to have help. They came for help. That's why they're here. And so easy to talk to them because they're... Most, 99% of them are just so open and eager to receive help from the Lord, and they listen and, and everything. It's so easy to counsel and to, and to work with. But, you know, the hardest time is to go home and tell. Oh, boy. And that's what he tells him. That's your job. You go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and how the Lord has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis. Now, Decapolis means the ten cities. Deca is ten. Polis is cities. The ten cities. There was a, a group of ten little cities there in that area. And he went all through those ten cities and told how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. He did a good job of it. As a matter of fact, when Jesus returns... There'll be a big crowd ready to receive him that time. The first time he came through, he only got one. And that one wanted to go with him because he didn't want to stay in that place anymore. And Jesus had him stay there. And then when Jesus returned, that man had gotten them all ready to come in. And he had a big welcome crowd wanting to hear the message of truth and deliverance. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure about it, let us encourage you to do it tonight. Get it straight. If you can't get it all fixed in your mind or you know that you know that you know that Jesus is in your heart, don't hesitate to come down and tell one of the workers who will be receiving the people. I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to say. They understand. I'll get somebody to sit down with the Bible and check out what you're depending on for your salvation. Don't be ashamed. You say, well, I'm ashamed to let anybody know I know it. Well, it's better to be ashamed now than to be ashamed up yonder when it's too late. I check up on it now and get it straight. There's no, there's no shame in being confused, but there is shame in going away and staying that way when you can get help. So let me encourage you to come if you're having problems in that area. Many people have. 
You won't be the first nor the last. Now, that's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented. This is producing compulsive behavior, and this slows down or stops or reverses spiritual growth and progress. Of course, we encourage you to come and receive help and deliverance. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out devils. That's why we do it, and we have many workers here who can help you with demonic problems. If you think you have demonic problems, by all means, come and somebody be working with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis very quickly to help you. And you say, well, what if they can't get the job done? That's why we have backup workers. They need help. They strike a stump. They'll, they'll call for help. But go along with the workers. You'd be surprised how efficient they are, how much good they are able to do. The sign, the, another sign that follows believes they shall speak with new tongues. We believe in that because Jesus did it. Said, it, uh, said we should do it, and it's still in existence for people today. And then another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you have physical needs, of course, Jesus is able to meet those, and there are people here with faith to believe with you and lay hands on you and believe for your healing, for physical needs. If you have a need, then we're going to stand and sing something about that name. As we stand and sing that, if you have a need, make your way to the center aisle. If you're a first-timer, cut the line, come right straight down through the front, and then work.